Greetings, Paige, Turners, and prepare to be captivated by the story that awaits. Brace yourselves for a gripping tale of 1984 by George Orwell. Liking and following my YouTube channel is the best way to show your support and ensure you never miss any of my future uploads. So if you're enjoying what you're watching, smash that like button. Hit that subscribe, follow button, and don't forget to leave a comment to share your thoughts. Part 1, Chapter 1 We are introduced to Winston Smith and the world in which he lives. He is a very aged 39-year-old man with a small, thin stature. He works in one of the four ministries that serve as the entire government of Oceania. The ministry names and functions are as follows. The Ministry of Truth, which regulates all forms of media, entertainment, and arts. The Ministry of Peace, which presides over all aspects of war. The Ministry of Love, which is a form of judicial system. And the Ministry of Plenty, which governs economic affairs. The description of life in his world is bleak at best. He lives in a filthy building that smells of boiled cabbage. The elevator is always broken and his flat apartment is on the seventh floor. He has a terrible time getting up and down the stairs on account of a constantly oozing and aching varicose ulcer just above his right ankle. When he finally gets home, he is greeted by the same type of environment that he just left at work. Constant surveillance by Big Brother, the government. This constant watch is kept on him by a telescreen which covers the wall and is constantly monitoring not only his every action and word, but also his facial expressions. The slightest notion through gesture or appearance against the party means death or worse. He must, in every aspect of his being, be a member of the party, the group that supports Big Brother. The thought police are always there to enforce that loyalty. Every description paints a picture of a cold, dark, empty, colorless existence. The party slogans, War is peace freedom, is slavery, ignorance is strength, are plastered everywhere the eye can see. Along with them, a portrait of Big Brother glaring with the caption, Big Brother is watching you. The overwhelming and growing discontent that Winston feels is immediately evident. Although it is a risk to his life, he has somehow procured a pen, ink, and a journal. There is a small alcove in his flat that just barely escapes the watch of the telescreen. He uses this as his sacred space to be himself and write. All of these actions are punishable by death. Even having a thought against the party, which is called thought crime, is labeled as an offense. When he begins to write, he realizes that he is not exactly sure of the date, his exact age, or of his own history, or that of the world. He thinks that it is April 4, 1984. He cannot really be sure of anything. However, because it is the intention and priority of the party to systematically erase the past and replace it with whatever they want to create. In the 1950s, a process began to dissolve the past through destruction of all newspapers, books, etc., and subsequently rewrite all of history to suit the party. Another part of this process includes the creation of a new language called Newspeak and complete dissolution of the current form of language known as Oldspeak. This process was to be complete by 2050. The new language will be exponentially shorter than the old language and void of emotion or imagery. For instance, all synonyms of good and bad, as well as the word bad, will cease to exist. In their place will be the words good and ungood. In order to say very good, one would say double plus good, and to say very bad, double plus and good would be used. The new vocabulary is being constructed strictly for political purposes. 
Words such as honor, morality, democracy, and science are cut out of the language completely. The word free has been retained, but only in the following type of context. The floor is free from litter. The telescreen serves more than just the purpose of monitoring the people. It is also the medium by which political propaganda is programmed into them. Throughout the day, flashes of Emmanuel Goldstein, the enemy of the people, appear on the screen in the form of the two minutes hate. This is a newspeak term describing a two-minute period during which footage and narration are especially geared towards accessing the depths of fear and anger in the people and turning it loose in support of Big Brother. There is yelling, name, calling, and throwing of objects at Goldstein's face on the screen, followed by group chanting BB, standing for Big Brother, repeatedly. One has to be careful not to be too calm or uninterested during the demonstrations, as this would serve as a definite clue to the thought police who may not be in full support of the party. In this section, we were also introduced to O'Brien. When he started writing his journal, he felt like O'Brien might be the only one that could ever help him in the movement to bring down Big Brother. He is sure that O'Brien gave him a certain flash of the eyes that made him know they were both in the same place against the party. We learn that, in general, Winston dislikes women. He believes that they are the most likely to believe everything the party says without question. The girl with dark hair is especially frightening to him. She is a member of the Junior Anti-Sex League and has a piercing glance that makes him sure. She is one of the thought police. Part 1, Chapter 2 In the midst of scrawling down with Big Brother in his journal, Winston is interrupted by a knock at the door. His insides jolt as he is expecting the thought police to be waiting to take him in. He is relieved to find that it is his neighbor, Mrs. Parsons requesting some help with a clogged drain. In addition to the familiar smell of boiled cabbage shared by the building, Winston finds that the Parsons' flat stinks of sweat. We find out that this smell is the calling card of Mr. Parsons, Tom. He is not there, which is why Winston is being called upon to help with the clog. While freeing the drain, he is attacked by the Parsons' children who were wearing the characteristic gray shorts, blue shorts, and red neckerchiefs that made up the official garb of the spies. Organizations such as the spies contributed to the unruly nature of most of the children in the party. The children clamored on calling Winston a traitor and insisting to be taken to see the public hangings. Winston departed, having suffered a painful catapult to the neck by the older boy. When he returned to his flat, he continued writing and his thoughts floated again to O'Brien. He remembered a dream in which a voice said to him, We shall meet in the place where there is no darkness. He had figured out that it was O'Brien's, but could not place when he had made the connection. He thought again about the eye contact they shared this very morning. He wasn't sure at that moment whether O'Brien was with him or against him, but he knew they had connected in some way. He continued writing and realized that at that moment he was already dead. He wrote, Thought crime does not entail death. Thought crime is death. Once he recognized himself as dead, he made it his intention to stay alive as long as he could and maybe make a difference for the future world. Part 1, Chapter 3 Winston is dreaming. The dream started with images of his mother and baby sister, then led to the girl with dark hair. He always thought of his family with remorse because he believed that they had been taken in order for him to be spared. He was awakened by the shrill alarm clock provided by the telescreen. He jumped out of bed naked because it was necessary for him to use his meager clothing allowance for work clothes and didn't have enough left for pajamas. 
Almost every morning, the workout forced by the telescreen called the physical jerks is preceded by a coughing fit that only calms through a series of body contortions and spitting up of lung fluid. The instructor coaches loudly and watches carefully through the wall to make sure everyone is pushing hard enough. This morning, Winston wasn't exercising to her standards, and she let him know it. She then proceeded to coax him into touching his toes with knees unbent. He succeeded at this for the first time in several years. During the workout, he reflected on his childhood. He remembered a time when there had been peace in the country, even though the telescreen insists that Oceania has always been at war with Eurasia. He distinctly recalled an alliance with Eurasia at some point. However, his memories are useless because according to the party slogan, who controls the past, controls the past, controls the future, who controls the future, controls the past. The party clearly controlled the past by systematic destruction of all materials that would contradict any point they are currently pushing and recreation of documentation of documentation of documentation to support their current claims. Part 1. Chapter 4. Winston trudged through his usual workday at the Ministry of Truth. He starts out by receiving slips of paper through message tubes, which list items in the newspaper, the times, which are to be corrected. He then locates the issues on the telescreen and makes the necessary changes. Once the corrections are made, he has actually rewritten the past. He sends the pieces of paper into what's called the memory hole. The paper then meets its fate in flames and is destroyed forever. The purpose of his work is always to make sure that any prediction the party makes is right. He takes great pride in his plagiarism. He marvels at the fact that his acts of forgery were changing things that never really existed anyway. Most of what was in the newspaper were numbers and facts that had no basis in reality. Therefore, his job was to forge forgeries. For instance, if the Ministry of Plenty projected a quarterly output of 145 million boots, and when the numbers come out, they read 62 million, his job is to change the figure in the records so that Big Brother's estimate in all recorded history would read 62 million. Very likely, there were no boots produced at all. Part 1, Chapter 5 Winston Heads to Lunch the lunchroom is deep underground with low ceilings. Today the room is crowded and noisy. Winston runs into Syme, who works in the research department. Syme was hoping to get an extra razor blade from Winston since he'd run out. Winston lied and told him he didn't have any. Razor blades were one of the many items that were short in supply by the party. At any particular time, there was any number of necessary items that party members went without. There was always the option of attempting a search on the free market, but it was usually to no avail. They sat down together to eat their regulation lunch that consisted of a bowl of pinkish gray stew, a small piece of bread, a nugget of cheese, and a cup of victory coffee served without milk but with one saccharine tablet. Syme talked about his work project, the 11th edition of the Newspeak Dictionary. He became enthralled by the discussion of paring down the language to just the necessary basics of communication. He exclaimed, Don't you see that the whole aim of Newspeak is to narrow the range of thought? In the end, we shall make thought's crime impossible because there will no words in which to express it. Every concept that can ever be needed will be expressed by exactly one word with its meaning rigidly, defined and all its subsidiary meanings rubbed out and forgotten. Already in the 11th edition, we're not far from that point. There had been a demonstration to thank Big Brother for increasing the chocolate ration. This was very strange since Big Brother had actually decreased the chocolate ration even though they had promised not to. He looked around the lunchroom with annoyance. His eyes fell on Mr. Parsons. 
He smirked as he thought he would never be vaporized. He catches the girl with dark hair looking at him again and is sure that she has been watching him. He is also sure that she would never be vaporized either. Part 1, Chapter 6 Winston is marking an entry in his journal, and through his writing, we learn more details about the party. If a member of the party were to partake in promiscuity with a prole, it was punishable, but not as severely as among party members, which was deemed unforgivable. All marriages have to be approved by a specially appointed committee. The only reason marriage is allowed is to beget children who are then molded into working for the party. If there is the slightest bit of attraction between the two, the union is refused. One purpose of the party involvement in these matters to prevent couples from forming loyalty that party couldn't influence. But the main reason was to dissolve all pleasure from the sexual act. Part 1, Chapter 7 Winston writes in his journal, If there is hope, it lies in the proles. Proles is short for proletarians, which is a word for the working class. He reflects on the current situation in Oceania, where 80, 5 of the population, is proles as proles. He thought about the percentage. The proles could easily take over the party. An uprising would be unstoppable. The problem, of course, is that it had been easy for the party to keep control of the masses. The thought police moved secretly among them, finding and removing anyone who seemed to be a potential threat to the system. By disbanding any potential leaders and groups that started to form, they prevented the force that could instigate rebellion. They allowed them to commit all criminal acts and live in perfect ignorance. Proles and animals are free. Another party slogan succinctly describes the management of the majority of the population. Part 1, Chapter 8 Winston walks alone down the street. It is the second evening at the community center he'd missed in less than a month. This is a great risk for him to take. This is a great risk for him to take since, since they are not to be alone any time except at night in bed. The aroma of real coffee, as opposed to the victory coffee provided by the party, wafted past his nostrils, reminding him of his childhood. As he strolled along, a bomb came and obliterated a series of houses nearby. He is pelted by shattering glass from a nearby window. He passed a group of proles with their attention glued to the lottery numbers. There were many that placed their only hope for living on the chance of winning the lottery. The party paid the large winnings out to people that didn't exist. The words he wrote in his diary echo through his head. If there was hope, it lay in the proles. The neighborhood is familiar to him. It was where he bought his diary in the pen and ink. He spotted an old man in a pub and excitedly entered with the intention of trying to talk to him. He wanted to engage in conversation with someone in an older generation and ask about the past. He wanted some form of confirmation about history and the present time that he knew to be true. The old man was ornery and drunk. You must have seen great changes since you were a young man, he asked. The man spun into a reverie of an incident at a boat race when someone knocked him over. Any further attempts Winston made at getting any kind of information out of him were also in vain. Feeling frustrated and helpless, he headed back to the street. He entered the shop where he had bought his diary. He spent a good bit of time there chatting with Mr. Charrington, the proprietor, as he showed Winston all of the few remaining wares in his shop. As he is leaving, the girl with dark hair passes. He freezes with panic. She must be following him. When he gets home, the telescreen is singing the latest song and he sits down with thoughts of the torture he will endure when he is brought in by the thought police. Part 2, Chapter 1 Winston is back at work 
and as he walks through a corridor, the girl with dark hair stumbles to the floor right in front of him. He starts to help her up, and she crams a small note in his hand. Time is standing still as he sits in his cubicle, waiting for an opportune time to read the note. When he finally reads it, he is shocked. He stares at it again to make sure he read it right. I love you. Suddenly, he is filled with desire. She disappears for a few days, and he is unsure whether the thought police vaporized her or she killed herself. After her reappearance, he makes a few attempts to get her alone at a lunch table. He finally succeeds, and they make arrangements to meet outside of work. At their brief meeting at Victory Square, they arrange another meeting when they can spend more time. Part 2, Chapter 2 On the appointed day, Winston made his way to the meeting spot. He arrived first and gathered some bluebells for the girl from the thick mass of them he had to walk through. She approached him from behind and made a motion to stay quiet. When they got a little further, she broke the silence. They exchanged various pieces of introductory information while she shared some chocolate she had gotten from the black market. They walked along and came to a pasture with a path meandering through it and intermittent molehills. He gasped with delight. The golden country. He had seen this landscape in dreams. They engaged in a romantic interlude and fell asleep. Part 2 Chapter 3. Upon awakening, Julia returned to her business-like demeanor and gave him instructions for his return home. They had planned to use this hideout one more time, but they never returned. They met once in a dilapidated old church, but usually only in the streets. Among the crowds, they could talk by installments, which meant they walked separately and would cut in and out of conversation as they passed each other. Sometimes, they had to leave a planned meeting spot without speaking because a patrol had just come by or a helicopter was circling. Part 2, Chapter 4 Winston's eyes move around the small room upstairs from Mr. Charrington's shop. He was still surprised at himself for having rented it as a romantic rendezvous point for him and Julia. They enjoyed real coffee with real sugar. A rat visits and causes Winston to become pale. He is terrified of rats. They make plans to rat. Proof the room as best as possible. Part 2, Chapter 5 Simi had finally been vaporized. Winston knew it would be coming for him eventually and now it had happened. He glanced at a list of the chess committee and found that Sim's name had disappeared altogether. This was the usual way when the thought police got you. All necessary changes and all records are made to make sure you had never even existed. Winston and Julia continued to meet at Charrington's shop. Every moment they had together, they knew it wouldn't be much longer before the end. They had to be found out. Meeting in the same place so often meant sure death. They often lay naked discussing the possibility of the existence of Goldstein's underground army, the Brotherhood. Winston is shocked to find out that Julia believed that Oceania had always been at war with Eurasia. In reality, just four years ago, Oceania was at war with East Asia. She had bought into what the party created. She didn't understand why it was such a big deal. He was mortified that she didn't see that the past was being destroyed right in front of their eyes, and nobody noticed. Part 2, Chapter 6 The moment he had been dreaming about for so long finally happened. O'Brien made his move to speak to him outside of work. In order to get Winston his address, he used the excuse of needing to get the 10th edition of the Newspeak Dictionary to him. Under usual circumstances, no one was to know the location of a person's home or see one another outside of work. His mind jumped to the process that had started with the opening of the diary and culminating at this moment with this summons from O'Brien. Even in his excitement, 
He felt better than ever. Part 2, Chapter 7 Winston awoke. He had been dreaming of his mother again. He told Julia about the dream and explained many details of the part of his childhood that he remembered. The moment he awoke was the first time he knew that he didn't murder his mother. He had believed that he indirectly was responsible for her death until just then. He remembered war and chaos, rubble in the streets, and always being hungry. When his father had disappeared, his mother didn't show any outward emotion, but her demeanor changed. He remembered that she became spiritless. She moved through the motions of life and duties of child-rearing quietly and mechanically. He recalled how selfish he was in his youth, how he actually stole food from his baby sister because his hunger was so overwhelming and continuous. This conversation turned into a discussion about what would happen when they were caught. They figured at the minimum there would be physical torture in various forms, drugs, forced sleeplessness, long periods of solitude, machines that monitor nervous responses, and endless questioning. They agreed that they would both confess to things they did and even things they didn't do in an effort to save themselves from any further horror. They agreed with righteous indignation that no matter what they confessed, no one could get them to change their feelings for each other. Winston thought about all the methods of torture they would use and decided that it didn't matter because they couldn't ever get inside of the mind. Part 2, Chapter 8 Winston and Julia finally get up the nerve to go to O'Brien's house. They get to see firsthand the luxuries of members of the inner party, clean accommodations, real coffee, a servant, and even permission to shut off the telescreen for short periods. O'Brien gets right down to business, explaining as much of the details of the Brotherhood as possible. The guests were surprised to find out that even the servant was a member of the secret anti-government coalition. O'Brien outlines the requirements of membership. They must be willing to steal, betray, be involved in things that could cause the death of thousands of innocent people, and anything else that is deemed necessary to the movement. They eagerly agreed to everything except separation from each other. He explained the way in which Winston would receive a copy of Goldstein's book to study. When they parted, O'Brien started to say, We shall meet again. And Winston, remembering his dream, finished his sentence, In the place where there is no darkness. O'Brien confirmed, and Winston and Julia left. Part 2, Chapter 9 Winston is exhausted from his part of the work in carrying out Hate Week. During the festivities of the sixth day of the celebrated week, the crowd watched with excitement as the speaker explained that they were no longer at war with Eurasia, they were now their allies. The new enemy was East Asia. The crowd picked up and placed their fury on the new enemy without missing a beat. Nobody asked any questions or even wondered at the apparent contradiction. Now they had always been at war with East Asia. All of records would soon reflect this change, and it would be made permanent. In the midst of the irate insanity, Winston was given Goldstein's book in the way that O'Brien had outlined. The only hope he had left was now in his briefcase. After hurrying to the sacred space above Mr. Charrington's shop, he lay intently focusing on each word of the text as he read. Therein lay the reality of the world situation, according to Goldstein. He pored over the material until Julia arrived, at which point he started back at the beginning and read to her. As he continued to read, he realized that he was receiving more information as to how the system worked, but he still didn't have any insight into why. Part 2, Chapter 10 Winston and Julia awoke to their destiny. A voice behind the picture they had often talked about while enjoying their private time spoke with an iron voice. It informed them not to move and that the house was surrounded. As Mr. Charrington walked in with a changed demeanor, 
they knew that they were looking at a member of the Thought Police. Part 3, Chapter 1 Winston looks around the white porcelain cell. Hidden lights flooded the room with bright light. He was surrounded by four telescreens. The ceilings were high, and there was a low, steady hum that could be heard at all times. He thinks he may be in the Ministry of Love, but since there were no windows, it's hard to tell. His hunger pains were growing and strengthening. Hoping to find some breadcrumbs, he sticks his hand in his pocket only to be loudly chastised by the telescreens. No movements were allowed. The party prisoners were always scared and quiet, while the regular criminals were insolent and loud. It is impossible to tell how long he had been in there. There is no sunlight coming in from anywhere, so he can't even tell if it is night or day. There was a constant parade of prisoners in and out of the room. During this time, Winston hears about Room 101. From the way people are using any tactic to try to avoid it, he knows it is the most horrible place imaginable. He hears boots approaching outside the door. He is shocked to see who enters. It is O'Brien. Part 3, Chapter 2 Winston lay on a bed. O'Brien is standing over him. There is a man with a white coat and a syringe. He reflects on the number of times he had been beaten and the length of each beating. He had confessed everything. He had admitted to things he hadn't even done. He rolled down a hallway shrieking with uproarious laughter and shouting confessions. O'Brien, the man in the white coat, Julia, and some others all rolled and laughed with him. During a moment of wakefulness, he hears O'Brien's voice saying, Don't worry, Winston. You are in my keeping. For seven years, I have watched over you. Now the turning point has come. I shall save you. I shall make you perfect. The voice Winston heard was the same that he heard in his dream seven years ago. I shall meet you in the place where there is no darkness. Winston is hooked up to a machine that floods his body with pain at O'Brien's command. O'Brien asks him questions, and if they're not answered to his liking, he gives the hand command. The pain is gradually increasing with every hand motion. O'Brien gently asked at this moment, What power is Oceania at war with? He answered Eastasia. O'Brien continued, And Oceania has always been at war with Eastasia, has it not? Winston hesitated. He knew that just a week ago, before he was arrested, Oceania was at war with Eurasia, but he also knew if he didn't give a satisfactory answer, the pain would come again. It seemed that during the whole interrogation process, O'Brien could read his mind. O'Brien told him to answer his truth. Winston did just that. O'Brien explained to him that it was a delusion. He cited other delusions. He had over the course of the last few years and then explained what the reality was. Winston can't understand why the party would spend so much time and energy getting him to agree with their ways instead of just killing him. O'Brien explains that he is a flaw in the pattern and that they are not content with obedience or submission. He further explains that when Winston finally surrenders to them, it must be on his own free will. They would not allow martyrs to go the grave exalting their cause with their death. The painful process continued. Part 3, Chapter 3 O'Brien explains the three stages of Winston's reintegration, learning, understanding, and acceptance. Room 101 will be his entrance into the second stage. Winston learns that O'Brien is one of the authors of Goldstein's book. He explains how it is all nonsense and would never happen. Winston remembers that he understood how the party system worked, but he never got a handle on why. O'Brien explained the why very simply, that the party wants power for its own sake. The object of power is power. Part 3, Chapter 4 He is feeling and looking better every day. The light and hum were the same, but his new cell was more comfortable than the last ones. It had a pillow, mattress, and a stool. 
He was being fed regularly. The food was good, and they even gave him some meat. He has been given warm water to wash with, and they had given him new clothes. He spent less time sleeping and started doing strength exercises. The party had succeeded in breaking him down enough to accept everything they said to be true. He wakes himself up yelling, Julia, Julia, my love. He knows his sleeping antics have betrayed him. He wonders how long he has added to his sentence from his outburst of emotion. As expected, O'Brien shows up in his room. He gives Winston the status of his progress. He is improving, and mentally he is fine, but emotionally his progress is stagnant. He reminds him that he is always able to tell when he is lying, and then asks him if he loves Big Brother. Winston answers, no, that he hates him. O'Brien tells him he must love Big Brother and sends him to room 101. Part 3, Chapter 5 Winston is in the worst place imaginable. Room 101. He knew it would be terrible from the reactions of everyone that was to go there. He still couldn't imagine what could be so terrible that he didn't already endure. O'Brien explained to him that in this room is the worst thing in the world. What is considered the worst thing in the world varies from person to person. In his case, O'Brien continued, it is rat. So there it was, the place where one would face their worst fear. Winston filled with terror at the word. He yelled and pleaded, O'Brien ignored him and continued describing a contraption that would allow the rat to be kept in a cage strapped to his head with walls on three sides, the fourth side being Winston's face. O'Brien unsympathetically explained rat's tendencies to chew their way to freedom frantically. The cage was fastened on his head and he could smell the stench of the creature. His vision was blocked so that he could only see one huge old rat with pink claws reaching up through the metal. As a last-minute hope, he screamed, Do it to Julia, not me. As he spiraled into the darkness of helpless fear, he heard a click and knew that it was the cage door closing shut instead of being opened. He had saved himself. He had also betrayed Julia. Part 3, Chapter 6 Winston sat in the Chestnut Tree Cafe listening to the telescreen. As he sat in his usual corner, a waiter continually filled up his glass of victory, gin without being asked. He quietly listened to the war updates while playing chess. He had a job that paid him better than his old one, and money was never a problem anymore. Any thoughts he had were short and usually had burned themselves out before they could get anywhere. He had recently seen Julia in the street, and he half-heartedly followed her. They got to a private place and began to talk. They calmly confessed to betraying each other. Without emotion, they agreed that after they were forced into the betrayal, they couldn't feel the same about each other. It ends with Winston finally losing the war against himself and loving Big Brother.